Breaking the wall to understanding life. How AI is accelerating computational biology. John Jumper, Deep Mind. On November 9th, 1989, I was four years old, getting ready for kindergarten. Hello, it's a great honor to be here. It's a really incredible event, and it's a great honor to uh, represent the work of a team that I lead at DeepMind, working on understanding life using AI, understanding biology. And I want to start with a bit of a paradox that you may not have thought of. We live in a rich 3D world. In your biology textbook, you see wonderful 3D pictures of cells, and you hear about DNA, the instructions for those cells which are a long string of four types of letters, a 1D thing. How does this information, how do we move from the 1D world of our DNA to the 3D world of our cells? And I'm going to tell the story in particular about proteins, individual nanomachines of the cells. The, as you saw in, a, in the previous speaker's talk, these 3D um, structures that do incredible chemistry, enzymes that make up structure, that make our muscles pull, that do all the functions of life, or are involved in all the functions of life. And in fact, the, your DNA has 20,000 genes that code for proteins. And when these uh, genes are translated into proteins, they are used to make essentially 1D structures. They started 1D, DNA, and three letters at a time, they're turned into one of 20 types of um, building blocks of proteins called amino acids. And so you have uh, 20 standard amino acids. And when one of these protein coding regions is translated, it attaches one after another, amino acid, amino acid, amino acid. It's turned the 1D DNA into a 1D string of amino acids. And yet, we haven't gotten to 3D yet. In fact, you can think of it as a long, wiggly chain, a disordered thing. And some proteins function disordered, but most actually create order spontaneously out of this. And this happens across life. In fact, scientists have cataloged hundreds of millions of proteins uh, throughout life, each of which, or many of which, make this jump from the 1D world to the 3D. And in fact, if you look at them, they, they make these intricate 3D structures. You can see the kind of ball and stick diagram on the left, all these many atoms, thousands of atoms working together uh, that's normally so complex, scientists don't like to look at it, and so they use these ribbon diagrams like in the middle that you saw in the previous speaker's talk. But the, the really interesting part is what told it to make that shape? How did it arise? How can we understand the shapes of all these proteins? Because this is the starting point for understanding how they function how they might misfunction in disease, what goes right and wrong, how can we use them for our own purposes, as our previous speaker was. And so there's been an incredible and enormous experimental effort over about 70 years on how to find these 3D structures of proteins, how to understand them. And this is an incredibly difficult process. I just, it, it has in, should have incredible respect. First of all, these weird 3D lumpy objects you need to convince them to crystallize, to form something ordered and regular like table salt. That's extraordinarily difficult. Then, if you succeed in that, which is very, very hard, then you can take that uh, protein crystal to a scientific instrument the size of a small village, right? A synchrotron, which is used to produce high-intensity x-rays, and you can bombard it with x-rays. And then you can do an extensive set of mathematical analysis, and if that works, then you will get one picture of a protein. And uh, this is unbelievably difficult. It's also unbelievably important, so we've done this trick about 200,000 times. Uh, solved about 200,000 structures. If you want to get a rough estimate, this can be a year or two of a PhD student's life, can cost order of $100,000 to get one of these. And uh, they're extraordinarily valuable, so we've collected and curated them and deposited them, deposited them in the Worldwide Protein Data Bank over about 50 years and made this incredible resource of the output of the structural biological community 
to understand these 3D structures. But of course, being a computational biologist, the first thought is, maybe we could have done it with a computer. Or maybe now that we have all this information, we can use it. And so in a, in a kind of computer scientist diagram, it's a very, very simple question. You start with a nice computer compatible string. Each of those letters represents one of the 20 amino acids that you can easily find from DNA sequencing. You can think of this as something like a few cents of cost now, maybe less, with the sequencing revolution. And can we find a computational means to turn that into a 3D structure on the right? And in fact, since I'm up on the stage, you can guess that the answer is probably yes. And uh, in fact, you can see here in green the experimentally determined structure, and in blue you can see a blind prediction uh, made of that structure with the system that I will tell you about today that we developed. And so how can we perform this computational alchemy, transmute the base metal of protein sequence into the gold of protein structure? And this story has a couple parts, not just the experimental part, but also a set of ideas that are developed in the field um, how do we understand this? And we can first understand maybe causality, that the protein sequence actually via physics alone uh, causes the protein structure to fo fold up, that certain amino acids have preferences to be near each other, certain have preferences to be on the surface. There are other proteins that help uh, find this order, but ultimately, and has been well understood for some time, the causal diagram is that the sequence causes the structure. Um, all right, uh, originally attributed an idea attributed to Anfinson. And now, that structure, however, is really important. The protein needs to fold correctly for us to live, for us to be functional organisms. And in fact, this has been true across evolution. So the structure of the protein, because it's needed to be functional, has had a very strong influence over evolution, has left its pattern across this kind of protein that has evolved across many, many organisms across long evolutionary time. And so by sequencing many organisms today, we can understand uh, something, we can get clues possibly to the structure of the protein. And uh, for the statisticians among you, you can think of this as Bayesian reasoning. If the structure leaves a uh, imprint on the evolutionary history, then we can work backward and try and deduce the structure from the evolutionary history. And so this has been an idea that's uh, very important has come up in the field, but it's still an extremely complex problem. We still don't know how to read it. We still don't know how to incorporate our understanding of physics and otherwise. And we needed a new set of tools. And the, the second set of tools that no one, has uh, no one will have missed recently is the rise of very powerful machine learning tools. And I think, you know, for the machine learners in the audience, you'll recognize some of these blocks, but I think for the non-machine learners, what's important to say is that we've developed incredibly generic tools to learn from data, learn really complex things from data. Um, you know, they can understand speech, they can generate images, they can write text now. These are incredibly generic tools, in fact, too generic. They know nothing about proteins. They work in some sense for everything if you have enough data. But data is extremely difficult to get in this problem. It's, it represents an extraordinary effort of the community to get it. And so somehow we need to work with less data, right? We need to work with the data that we have. And so the way that we did that is that we said, okay, how do we build the knowledge that scientists have developed, physical, evolutionary, all the constraints that we know go in, how do we build that into the blocks of our neural network? How do we build that into the core of our neural network so that it is pre-organized to understand proteins? And how do we really focus on the 3D structure? And so this is a very, very difficult problem. It's a very interesting, exciting problem. It's a place in which we can really use mathematics and our understanding of mathematics and our intuition to understand biology. And so we built this really quite complex thing, um, probably the most complex uh, network that we've built at DeepMind. And I won't tell you about all the details. I want to tell you a little bit maybe more about the story and about how we go from the input sequence on the left all the way to the output to a prediction of the protein structure on the right. And to do that, we in essence set up the network as a conversation. We set it up as a conversation between the different factors that we 
know are important that we know influence structure. So we have what's the multiple sequence alignment, which is a very technical name for how we represent evolution. And then we have a representation of space, or pairs of amino acids. And so we set up these two kind of rep dual representations of, say, biology and space or physics. And then we use those blocks, those building blocks that I told you about, in order to let them talk, in order to exchange information. And so we set up this kind of repeated conversation where on each arrow, you can think of this as a complicated, weird neural network thing. But what's important, it's much like kind of everyday life. As important as what's said is who you get talking to each other and how you set these conversations up correctly. And so if you set up this type of conversation where what we understand about the physics is used to reinterpret the evolution, what we understand about the evolution is used to reinterpret the 3D structure, <coughs> you can get an evolving and developing view of the 3D structure within the neural network, and you can get dramatically more efficient learning. And so by setting this up and by setting up very specific interactions, we can get an evolving view of the protein structure within the computer, within the steps of this neural network. And in fact, we can look at those individual pieces and how our understanding of the structure develops throughout the network. We can peer into the stages of the black box. And what we see <coughs> is a rapidly refining view of the structure within the neural network. And so at each step, and each of these numbers represents a place within the neural network, we can see we learn more and more about the structure of the protein until we come to a quite accurate and refined picture of it. And the result of doing that is that we've massively improved how much 3D structure we have an understanding of in the human proteome. So gray represents the combined output of the experimental and computational communities for highly accurate protein structures. And dark and light blue represents at different confidences the increase in understanding via AI and these computational methods that we've developed. And so you can see it's quite dramatic improvements in our understanding of the structure of the proteins within the cell. And in fact, <coughs> excuse me, a large fraction of what is remaining is in fact intrinsically disordered proteins. And so by combining basically experimental and mathematical ideas, we've made a dramatic leap in our understanding of, the, of these important units that are targets of drug discovery, that are important for understanding health and disease. And we've made it all freely available, not just the code, but also predictions for the human proteome. For in fact, we started with 21 model organisms, E. coli, yeast, et cetera, and now over 200 million predictions of protein structures across life. <coughs> and this represents roughly all uh, predictions for all proteins whose genome has been sequenced. Now, I think one really important point to say, and you know, the talk is about understanding life in general, can we do this trick again? In what cases can we move from experimental data to highly accurate AI predictions of that data? And I think it will become very common. In fact, I think we'll start to design our experiments for it and really amplify the output of the experimental community. And so what you should really think of these AI methods as doing as providing extra leverage for experimentalists that once we get kind of a sparse picture of something that is regular, that is capturable, and even possibly an extremely complex function, we can use AI to complete that picture. And in fact, we're at DeepMind working very hard on the next kind of questions and where do we go, not just beyond structure, how do we understand how individual mutations in a cell change the behavior of proteins, how do proteins move? We think this will be done many more times, and it will dramatically accelerate our understanding of life, our ability to design interventions, drugs, et cetera. We think it's a very, very exciting time where we have tools, finally, that may match the complexity of biology uh, computationally and that we can really use to understand life. And with that, I want to thank both uh, the team at DeepMind that built this and our partners at Imbol EBI, with whom, uh, without whom the database would not have been possible and finally, and especially the experimental community, which produced the data we needed to do this. Thank you.